All right, everyone, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to introduce, and he will take over, uh, Ryan Holmberg. And uh, this panel is uh, Fukushima Devilfish, Susumu Katsumata's Anti-Nuclear Manga. Uh, Ryan Holmberg is an academic associate of the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Culture, and starting in October, an associate professor at the University of Tokyo. As a freelance art historian and critic, he is a frequent contributor to the Comics Journal, Art Forum International, and Art in America. As an editor and translator of manga, he has worked with Breakdown Press, Striving Quarterly, Retrofit Comics, Picture Box Incorporated, and New York Review Comics. He's also the author of Garo Manga, The First Decade, 1964 to 1973, uh, from Center for Book Arts in 2010. Um, and his presentation provides a preview of two of his upcoming publications. A collection of Katsumata's manga titled Fukushima Devilfish from uh, Sysjack and Breakdown Press, as well as No Nukes for Dinner, How One Japanese Cartoonist in His Country Learned to Distrust the Atom, uh, Publisher to be Determined. And uh, with that, um, Ryan, if you wanna come up here, go down there, um, he will go ahead and start his presentation. Um, thank you to SPX and for inviting me and hosting me and also for Rob for being nice enough to invite me. Um, I have to uh, disclaimer that uh, I haven't spoken to anybody in months about anything, especially comics, so a little rusty on this topic. Uh, a lot of the research based uh, for this talk is stuff I had done last year. It was supposed to be published over the course of the year, then certain things happened and the publications have been delayed, so I'm also rusty. Uh, in the sense that this subject matter is only something I'm now getting back into uh, because pretty soon I have to finish a, a manuscript on it. Um, so what I want to talk today about is about uh, one specific cartoonist named uh, Katsumata Susumu. Uh, you might know the book from uh, Drawn and Quarterly published a number of years ago called Red Snow. Um, that is some of Katsumata's work about, his, uh, about rural Japan. Uh, and the stuff that I was interested in was the material he did on nuclear power plants and uh, to a lesser degree nuclear weapons. And the reason I got into this topic was a couple of things. First, uh, Katsumata was one of the main artists for the magazine uh, Garo, which was a major uh, venue for alternative and experimental and literary manga in Japan. Uh, and the other reason is that I was living in Tokyo at the time of the Fukushima Daiichi meltdowns. Uh, and it really changed my view of so much in Japan and in terms of uh, what energy means, not just in terms of consumables and renewables, but also the dangers um, involved. Um, and I was really interested in kind of a back history of it, because there's this reputation in Japan that the Japanese anti-nuke movement uh, has always been focused on weapons uh, due to the legacy of Hiroshima. Um, and there's always an assumption that Hiroshima and Fukushima are somehow linked. Uh, but the more you learn about the history, the more you learn that Fukushima and Hiroshima really weren't linked until very recently in the Japanese imagination that even uh, left-wing parties in Japan who were strongly anti-nuclear weapons uh, were associated with the Japanese Communist and Socialist Party, and they believed that nuclear energy was necessary for uh, national growth. So there was a divide uh, for until very recently, it's probably until the 1980s or 90s, uh, between Hiroshima and Fukushima. And I was kind of interested in seeing that back history, and I was also excited to find that Japan, despite its reputation as a country in which uh, political activism is low, that in fact uh, the anti-nuke movement in Japan has been very strong since the 1970s, even without nothing to do with Hiroshima and nuclear weapons. And that also that as a result, I mean, there's manga about everything and including nuclear power uh, going back uh, in a critical uh, fashion back to the 1970s. So I was interested in, in kind of unearthing that history and also thinking about kind of a, a different atomic comics history because people, when people talk about atomic comics, usually think about things like this, you know, uh, superheroes who are quasi-nuclear or uh, have powers that are, uh, mutant powers that are inspired by uh, um, exposure to radiation, et cetera. And then you have in Japan uh, artists like Nakazawa Keiji, uh, he himself was a hibakusha, which means he was exposed directly to the bombings in Hiroshima. Um, and he was drawing comics, and uh, he started writing about 
uh, Hiroshima in the 1960s and started doing autobiographical things about Hiroshima in the early 1970s. This is an edition published by Leonard Reifus in the States in the early 80s. And then also something that's kind of like dropped out of most books or texts that you will read about atomic comics across the globe is the fact that there has been a small, uh, vibrant but very small uh, tradition of comics about nuclear power um, specifically. And a lot of this in the States came out in the 1970s, um, I, even prior to Three Mile Island when a lot of artists, when the anti-nuclear power movement really took off uh, in the United States. And the most famous is on the left, All Atomic Comics by Leonard Reifus, um, which uh, he tells me uh, between, I think it's English and German editions, uh, sold something like 50,000 copies. Um, and then also um, it appears um, also in uh, mainstream superhero comics. Here's the thing in the She-Hulk um, saving the Diablo Canyon plant in uh, California from sabotage, um, right? But in Japan, too, what's interesting about Japan is not only do you have uh, its most famous superhero being uh, Atomu, right, Astro Boy, who's a mix of uh, microchip computer processors and a small reactor uh, in his chest. Um, he debuted in 1951. And, you know, at, at the time that Tezuka first did this, uh, nuclear energy was still kind of a dream technology. Um, and Tezuka himself never really saw any um, contradiction between having a superhero like this and also being... Um, anti-war and anti-nuclear weapons himself. And after Chernobyl happened in 1986, a lot of people asked Tezuka, was Atomu supposed to be propaganda for the nuclear industry? He said, no, definitely not. I am against nuclear power and always have been. But subsequently, it's come out that there's been quite a few objects that he's said that he had nothing to do with that were pirated, in which the nuclear industry, which is a big producer of actual physical culture in Japan, um, was producing pamphlets and hiring places as Japan, Japan's biggest cartoonist, Tezuka, to do pro-nuclear pamphlets. Uh, and most, one of the most notorious ones is the one you see on the right. Um, Adam Astro Boy goes to the jungle, and here uh, what happens is that the jungle is getting cold. There's some kind of weird climate change that hasn't been described. Um, and the animals are suffering, and they call up Astro Boy. Astro Boy says, come to Japan, come to uh, Atomic University. I'll teach you how to make nuclear reactors. They build one, they take it back to, um, they take it back to, uh, to Africa, and they build the, the atomic plant, and then they wire these giant heat lamps to rewarm Africa. So it's this crazy kind of like global warming thing fueled by nuclear power uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, save this third world uh, continent, right? And it's interesting, too, because this is right around the time, this is late 1970s, that Japan kind of went from being an importer of nuclear technology to kind of using its uh, treaties with the United States to become an exporter of nuclear technology. And it started to sell components and propose uh, plants to developing countries in uh, Asia. Uh, the earliest one is in Taiwan, and that happens in the late 1970s. So it's interesting you have this story that's about like Japanese nuclear exports to the, the developing world uh, made at the time. Uh, Tezuka disavowed. He said that the nuclear industry just took Astro Boy, but he's done other things in which it's very clear that it's his studio's hand. So Tezuka uh, is a liar about this issue and many others. <laughs> um, now the nuclear industry has lots of money being backed by uh, the government and Japan's largest co corporations. Um, and they also bought space in the, main, the biggest Japanese comic man manga magazines. Uh, this one is on the right, Shonen Magazine, so which by the late 1970s would have had a weekly print run probably around 4 million. So there um, was a work that is uh, very poor artistically by the magazine standards that somehow was serialized in the magazine for three weeks, and it's called The Great Tokyo Blackout. And why it doesn't talk about nuclear power uh, explicitly, it's clearly kind of a uh, piece about how existing uh, energy technologies will not suffice uh, to keep Japan going and developing in case there's uh, a loss of electricity. And what happens is that various things come together. There's a lightning storm that pulls down power lines, uh, weird things like a group of jellyfish because of the water temperatures are wrong, kind of flood all the intakes at all the coal-fired plants around Tokyo Bay. The to the, all the, to the coal fire plants shut down. And so a, a person at Tokyo Electric, Te TEPCO, which is also the same company that ran the Fukushima Daiichi plant, 
he's kind of this hero that you see here, and he saves the day uh, by figuring a way to, to reroute electricity and, and get the, 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 the grid operative again. An anti-nuke group saw this, and they said, this, it's very suspicious that this kind of random comic would appear in Japan's top ki kids, uh, children's manga magazine, um, despite that it's obvious. Uh, it's A, because it's so factual. Where did this artist get all these facts? and also because of its uh, kind of didactic nature, which you don't see very often in magazines like this. Right? So they were buying, not just advertising space, they were buying enough, they were paying the magazine and Kodansha enough money, basically, to have them serialize the work that they made. So the nuclear energy industry was pumping tons of money into not just, not so much, uh, not only convincing Japanese adults and voters in the present, but they were also thinking about in the future, that they wanted Japanese children to support nuclear energy uh, for uh, decades into the future. And also in uh, trashy Gekiga magazines, uh, you also uh, had people writing about nuclear uh, culture from a very different perspective. Uh, this is a well-known Gekiga artist from the 1970s named Miya Kazuhiko. Um, he did one of the earliest ones in 1978 called um, the fish poacher's white skin. And this takes place in Mie Prefecture, a kind of pearl production area with divers. It's the area where Mikimoto Pearls is uh, located. Uh, she's a diver. Uh, she's an abalone diver um, looking for pearls. But her husband's family owns land that the nuclear industry wants. They hire the Yakuza to basically off the entire uh, village, everyone who they can't uh, kill. They think they kill her, but she actually kind of uh, re-emerges from the depths uh, and starts harpooning all the Yakuza members uh, and I, all the local bureaucrats and politicians who sold out the prefecture to the nuclear industry. Um, and it's interesting because oftentimes when you read about uh, kind of like nuclear symbolism in the West, it's oftentimes phallic, right? It's like the mushroom cloud, it's like nuclear power, energy, right? But in this case, you have a situation where the anti-nuke side, right, especially kind of like the, re rebel, the rebel side is feminized. Right? And it's also interesting because most anti-nuke movements initially in Japan, both in the cities and the rural areas, were run by women. Um, uh, in the cities, mainly uh, mothers who were worried about uh, uh, kind of bills, uh, what nuclear energy kind of taxed on electricity bills. And in the uh, countryside, mainly only women were left in the countryside because of out-migration to Tokyo and Osaka. So they, oftentimes, they were oftentimes spearheading the anti-nuclear industry uh, anti-nuclear movement in Japan, which is very different from nuclear culture um, elsewhere. And the other thing is that because of, all of Japanese nuclear plants are built along the ocean, you also have a lot of ocean and uh, aquatic metaphors in a lot of these uh, manga, which you don't see much um, elsewhere. Now the stuff that I was really interested in is work by Katsumata Susumu. Like I said, not just because he uh, was associated with Garo, which I've done a lot of writing and research about, um, but also um, because he did a great variety of work. Uh, in terms of page count, some of these Gekiga artists were doing many more, even though they weren't, you know, for them, nuclear energy was just kind of a background topic, right? Like you would write about terrorism um, or some kind of a political assassination, right? It was a kind of a hot thing to write about and set your manga against. But Katsumata is interesting because he was trained in graduate school as a nuclear physicist until he dropped out. Um, and then he didn't do any kind of nuclear comics really until the late 1970s. And I think if had in Japan at the time, had there been a category like comics journalism, which in Japan still really doesn't exist so strongly, that Katsumata Susumu probably would have done uh, kind of comics journalism about nuclear energy, which is kind of a, a topic that's hard to make interesting uh, if you don't have a disaster to work with. Um, but in lieu of that, he did kind of fictional story manga, did research, did four panel strip cartoons, did children's science book illustrations, um, and a variety of other things. Um, so it's kind of interesting that if you don't have a certain genre in a specific country of a certain artistic practice, like comics journalism, how else do you get at that kind of like non-fictional reporting aspect to communicate what you want? Right? So what's interesting, and <clears throat> Another thing that's interesting about uh, Japanese nuclear uh, culture, which is uh, fairly different from other countries, is that a lot of the anti-nuke manga, uh, and this includes Katsumata, uh, 
Um, they're not about disasters, but they're about people. And the people that they're oftentimes about are uh, the cleanup workers, oh, sorry, the people who work at nuclear power plants. Now this might be familiar to you uh, from a book that was recently published in English uh, from Kodansha uh, Ichiefu, right? It's a, uh, it is a legit work of comics journalism by someone who uh, worked at the Fukushima Daiichi plant after the plant melt, melted down in 2000. 11. He was part of the cleanup uh, operation uh, off and on different stints, I think between 2012 and 2015 or so. Um, it was a big hit in Japan. I don't know how it's doing in the States, um, but he kind of like details uh, what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis of working at the disaster site. And a lot of the details are very uh, small and, you know, uh, non-dramatic, right, about like what kind of masks, what kind of anti-contamination wear you must uh, put on in order to work there, what are your exposure doses, et cetera, right? So trying to make do with a set of information that in itself is not inherently dramatic uh, visually or otherwise. Um, but he's also kind of like working on a long tradition of uh, writing about nuclear power in Japan. And a lot of writing about nuclear power and some of the most popular and successful in Japan has been about people who work as uh, maintenance people inside nuclear power plants in Japan. And this goes back to the 1970s and is in a kind of a tradition of undercover expose reporting about uh, the Japanese economic dream. You know, people were going into plants like Toyota, which uh, the government in the West was seeing as kind of the, the new way of doing factory uh, production, right? And reporters were going in as undercovers and showing that actually if you weren't uh, in the upper echelons of uh, the staff at a place like Toyota, you were working horrible hours for horrible money and you were endangering your life, um, both because of unsafe work conditions and also because you were overworked. Now this kind of genre of expose writing against uh, Japanese labor conditions uh, transferred to the nuclear power industry because the nuclear power industry was advertising itself as the clean new energy, the safe new energy, right? And the previous big energy source in Japan had been coal and coal uh, you know, being a coal miner is not a safe occupation. So what these uh, reporters were trying to show was that nuclear energy itself was also kind of creating poor labor conditions by hiring what they were, the press started calling uh, genpatsu gypsies, uh, basically nuclear power plant gypsies, these part-time laborers who had no uh, uh, worker protections, were hired for a short period until they maxed out the radiation doses and then basically d dismissed to the following year also, there are different types of documents were uh, doctored so that they could work longer. And all, a lot of times their uh, income was eaten up by Yakuza uh, middlemen, etc. So this became a big genre of writing. Even in the late 1970s, there was a couple exposés about the nuclear power industry on this topic. Uh, also, photographs of people uh, going in and showing that the nuclear power plants, you uh, can't really only understand them by the exterior or the computer control room. But you also have to go into the, the bowels of them and see what the labor conditions actually like. You have to wearing these uh, kind of plastic suits in 120 degree temperatures. And everything's still hot, even though the, the, the reactors are down because of all the residual heat. Right? And it also leaked into manga. Uh, Mizuki Shigeru, who probably all of you know as the author of Kitaro and then the Showa series that B&Q um, has done. He was hired by uh, this is Asahi Graf to illustrate something by uh, Horie Kunio, who had also written the, uh, Genpatsu, the nuclear power plant gypsy books. So he illustrated a story about uh, one worker that happens to be at the Fukushima Daiichi plant back in the 1970s, who committed suicide um, because he had uh, his, I guess his girlfriend or his wife was worried that because of his exposure to radiation that if they had any children, uh, they would have deformities. So she left him, and then he was fired, so he ended up killing himself. So there's an expose about that. Now, Mizuki was working with photographs taken inside the plant, so there is a d degree of kind of realism to his works, but he was also making up a lot as he goes along. Like you see the top left, um, the cooling tower. As far as I know, no Japanese nuclear power plant has cooling towers. That scared face that you see top left um, is from a... Um, what's that movie called? The Jane Fonda movie. The, China what's that? China Syndrome. It's basically an image from uh, China Syndrome PR pamphlet. 
And then this is also 1979, is that the year? 1979 is also the year that Alien uh, came out. So you have like the nuclear power plant looking a little bit like H.R. Geiger's uh, design of the Alien uh, spaceship. Right? And here you have them uh, inside the containment uh, sucking out all this goo that is uh, amassed from deterioration of uh, products um, inside the containment. And when this book was republished in, after the meltdowns in 2011, they deleted this image, which shows the guy having killed himself. Uh, I mean, nominally, this book was supposed to, to show how Japanese power plants had been dangerous overall, despite what the industry was saying, that the disaster was unforeseen and unstoppable. Um, but nonetheless, uh, they decided to cut probably what is the sharpest image in it, uh, perhaps out of uh, respect to the, the dead person's family. I think some um, ethics regarding um, personal and private information in Japan has kind of improved a lot in uh, interceding decades. Now, what's interesting is that you've seen that the, the top of the book is uh, cut off. Um, but so right around this time, Katsumata Susumu, who had done had been doing mainly stories for Gato about uh, rural Japan, he becomes recruited by the Japanese nuclear industry, uh, anti-nuclear movement, because the anti-nuclear movement wants to start creating his own counter propaganda in different ways. And Katsumata was involved in what is probably the best-selling uh, book about the dangers of nuclear energy in Japan, called uh, Genpatsu wa Naze Kawaika, uh, Why Are Nuclear Power Plants Scary? Or Why Is Nuclear Power, uh, nuclear power Plants Scary? Um, he illustrated the book. That's what he's credited for. He probably, his, his widow told me that he probably also wrote most of the book. And if you read literature about the anti-nuke movement in Japan, this book was designed for high school students as a kind of primer on the dangers of this energy source, but it also made its way out into the rural areas. So you have reports of farmers or fishermen who read this book as their knowledge about uh, why they should be fighting it. So Katsumata was involved in a, in a, in a project uh, that was, um, had a lot of impact on how Japanese thought about nuclear power. And as you can see on the cover, once again, it's a, nuclear, it's a nuclear power plant worker, a nuclear gypsy who's on the cover of this book, right? And it includes various illustrations like this, showing the Fukushima Daiichi plant, which we now think of as Japan's worst nuclear power plant, but already had a bad reputation since the 70s as a dirty and dangerous plant. Um, and you also have images like on the left of uh, bioaccumulation of radionuclides uh, due to um, uh, you know, waste from nuclear power production, about how storage bins for spent fuel and other things were leaking into the Japanese soil. These are all. And you also have Katsumata using part of Horie Kunio's book, the Genpatsu Gypsy book, um, to do short manga inside it. And this is an episode from Horie's book about why he thought that nuclear power plants weren't even designed with maintenance in mind. And the reason is that if you want to design a power plant for maintenance, you have to think about how people will move inside the plant to maintain them. And he's saying that the spaces are too small, you can barely fit into them. In addition, in order, if you're working inside the containment and you have to take a piss, you have to basically uh, take off all your anti-seaware, you have to go through the radiation checks, you have to run, I can't see what it says, how many meters? 300 meters, finally, to find a shower drain in which you can piss at, right? So, so this idea that you know, nuclear power is inhuman or non-human at various different levels, and that the nuclear industry cannot say that it's safe because it's not even thinking about how to maintain its plans, uh, plants on a human level, right? But at the same time, Katsumata was not only adapting things from existing uh, journalistic reports, he was also doing some site visits himself, and he uh, did a number, these are um, never published photographs uh, that his widow has. He visited the Fukushima Daiichi plant and Dai Ni plant. There's a second nuclear facility of only about 10 miles south of uh, the Fukushima Daiichi plant. And what a lot of people don't know is that the Fukushima Dai Ni plant was also inundated by the tsunami and also had electricity problems. So uh, even a second plant was in danger of having a meltdown in 2011. So it's interesting you have some, now we think of the Fukushima Daiichi plant, if you guys have any images of it not blown up, it's usually you have that mottled uh, blue and white box over the, the reactors. You can see back in the 80s it's a different color, but it's this. So you have images of the plant, of the guards, very lax security back in the day. 
right? He had uh, pictures of how workers are going through the, uh, the radiation counters, right? Um, and this is an instructive photo that he took. Uh, I guess the industry took him out on a little boat trip so he could see the Fukushima Daini plant um, from a distance. Is there a pointer on this? What you can see here, you'll notice is that this is the ocean, right? This is where the tsunamis come from. And this is the idea of a seawall back in the 80s of the nuclear industry, right? Subsequently, they built it about twice as high, but they thought this was sufficient for earthquake country Japan back in the 1980s. And the way they designed is that these small cubicles, cube buildings, these are the intakes for cooling the reactors, right? So those, they, they're what keep the reactors from not melting down. So you can see when a tsunami comes, these are, these are going to be the first things that wiped out, right? And the turbine hall and the, and the reactors are back here, right? So safety was, was most definitely not part of the program in designing Japanese uh, nuclear power plants. And these are pictures from inside the containment. Back then, they even take people for tours inside the plants, right? And this is kind of interesting. I don't know if those of you who read Japanese understand this, but it says, uh, ochiruna otosuna, which means uh, don't fall, don't drop it. And, what it, and, and Horie Kunio, uh, in his book, writes that this was basically the nuclear industry's idea of safety, right? <laughs> which is not like protect the workers, but worker don't fall into any holes because if you get injured, then we'll get in trouble and there'll be kind of government inspections. So don't injure yourself, right? And the second is don't drop any equipment. Otherwise, it'll get damaged and be, equi and be expensive to fix, right? So this is the idea of safety, basically like take care of the plant, right? Like, don't worry about yourself so much. Now, Katsumata uh, started doing kind of quasi-non-fictional quasi stories um, based around these nuclear power plant workers, right? Well, the most famous is uh, Deep Sea Fish, done for the magazine uh, comic Baku, which is the same magazine that carried uh, Yoshiharu Tsuge's uh, Man Without uh, Talents, which is out in every, in every language but um, English, but that made soon change, I hope. Um, so there's a scene of the workers in the morning going to the plants. And this takes place at a, I think the plant's called Minami Soma plant, which is basically the Fukushima Daiichi plant, right? And it shows them getting ready for work, uh, being hired, being instructed about what's involved going in and out. And if you do comparisons between the photographs in the images, you see that Katsumata was using his site research to make these works um, and having different ways of like, how do you in, uh, visualize the invisible matter of radiation exposure? So the ga 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 is the sound of Geiger counters or just radiation counters. And here you have him as he's slowly being exposed, getting more and more of these pox um, on him, right? So kind of a very, very aesthetically pleasing and also interesting way of depicting exposure. Right, and this is an image of uh, you could, they won't let you out of the building unless you are uh, free of radiation to a certain degree. And uh, here's a guy who he cut himself while working, but because of his injuries, uh, there's still radiation particles in there that he has to take a wire brush and uh, vigorously uh, clean out his wounds so that they'll let him out of the plant. Right, and the, the sound effects particularly violent, right? Buddy, 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 buddy. So it's like a wire brush on his skin, right? And this guy gets to go home early uh, because he has already cleared his uh, radiation exposure dosage uh, for the day. He says, I'm heading back. They say, what are you going to do? He said, maybe I'll pick up a chick and have some fun. They're like, yeah, right. So he goes back to his hotel. He stays in a love hotel, right? And he actually does uh, spend the afternoon uh, with a woman but a woman on television. So, and it ends him passed out in his room, sleeping, goo goo, right? And it's kind of an interesting uh, triple layering of visual metaphors. So he has these spots on his back, which are supposed to be, you know, radiation exposure, lesions or marks of some sort, obviously uh, exaggerated. Um, they're also supposed to be hickeys, right? And they're also supposed to be uh, flat, uh, cherry blossoms, right? So this idea that he's basically kind of like losing, because in cherry blossoms, the falling of cherry blossoms is a symbol of kind of like passing youth in Japan, that he's kind of, you know, uh, his youth is being, loss of his youth is being expedited by working in these conditions, right? 
in addition to being kind of an image of his loneliness um, in this kind of temporary uh, labor situation. Um, this is another story that he did, which will be in uh, one of the translated books that I'm working on. Should be out by the end of the year. Um, this is a book about. This is a story about a octopus that's caught in the intakes, and they equate the octopus, which sometimes in stressful situations eats its own limbs, um, to what nuclear power plant workers do. Basically, you're killing yourself uh, by working there. But here you see very clearly how Japanese. Uh, uh, kind of the aquatic metaphor appears a lot in Japanese anti-nuclear culture. Now, <clears throat> what I want to show you really quickly is how did Katsumata get into this kind of topic? Because it wasn't a super popular topic. There's, a, there's some material, but it's scattered. And how did he get into this topic? He has kind of an interesting background, as I said. Most people know him as one of the artists of Garo. You're seeing a cover of Garo on the right. And uh, a lot of the stories are about stories about tanuki and kappa and other mythological folk creatures from the Japanese countryside, right? But the, he was also mainly a writer of four panel uh, satirical strips for Garo. He was Garo's kind of political uh, cartoon, cartoonist for a while. Um, and the industry, uh, the news, mass media kind of picked up on this and was really interested because it says here, um, so, what happens if a nuclear physics, physics master's student um, would be draw, started to draw cartoons? So the Japanese, in general, in the 1960s, were really interested in this idea that comics are now being read, read by adults. And on the other side, you have basically a nuclear physicist in training who's making cartoons. And the juxtaposition was really interesting to the mainstream press. Now, at the time, Japanese universities were not a very pleasant place to be uh, educated in uh, because of the Vietnam War, because of certain kinds of corruption and embezzlement issues. Japanese uh, universities were in turmoil, where you had uh, radical leftist groups uh, infighting, uh, fighting uh, the police, fighting administration, uh, barricading universities uh, for various reasons. And what's oftentimes forgotten in the history of uh, the Japanese uh, political movements in the 1960s is that quite a few of these, some of the main of uh, these student movements in the 1960s were actually directed at uh, big science and the links between Japanese research universities, uh, American military bases, and um, kind of a, a, uh, both the energy industry and kind of a burgeoning military industry in Japan. Uh, now where Katsumata went to school. He went to a school called the Tokyo University of Education, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, and there, the uh, protests were very uh, specific in that the, it's a national university, and the government wanted to create a new science university in Tsukuba, which is, I don't know how far, maybe 200 kilometers north of Tokyo. And what they do is they wanted a national university to kind of like scoop out its science program and ditch the rest and move it. And the students are opposed to this. And the reason they wanted that university is that one of the, the former president and then uh, one of the main professors at Tokyo University of Education was someone named Tomonaga Shinichiro. He won the Nobel Prize in 1965 uh, alongside Richard Feynman uh, which it, with his work in quantum mechanics. So they wanted him to kind of lead up the new physics department, which of course would have been tied to the nuclear industry in Japan. They wanted him. But he was also a very staunch anti-nuclear weapons advocate. And that culture was also very strong at Tokyo University of Education. Uh, they had a kind of a local pugwash conference uh, about nuclear weapons, about Hiroshima, et cetera. And indeed, some of uh, Katsumata entered school in 1966. And some of his first cartoons for Garo, uh, which in, in the beginning days was very strongly associated with the Japanese uh, Socialist Party, um, he was doing um, comics about nuclear weapons in the early 19, in the mid-1960s. Uh, on the top here, you know, Japanese kids at school assembling a, a nuclear, an A-bomb and, and of jets. And then here you have um, Tanuki riding on this roller coaster of the anti-nuclear movement, which was in the process of uh, splitting, splintering into various factions and losing, it, losing its power in Japan, right? Now, Katsumata also did a number of uh, panel, a uh, number of strips about what it means to be a science student in Japan at the time. Um, here you have, it looks like the professor talking to the students with equations on the board, and it turns out he's gossiping about Audrey Hepburn's marriage. 
And here you have another one. What does it say at the top? You go, there's students getting a tour of the university. The top one says, this is the library. And they say, this is the laboratory. And he says, impressive. Next one says, this is the lecture hall. Spacious, says the student. And then the last one says, Congre uh, what does it say? Uh, anyway, congratulations on graduating, right? So the whole idea is that the first time that the student has seen any of the classrooms of the library, the lecture hall, is on the day of his graduation, right? And then you have ones that are more uh, <clears throat> directly tied to kind of American military funding of Japanese research at Japanese universities. Um, here you have, um, this one's not so interesting, this one's more interesting. Uh, here you have some scientists experimenting on a little bunny rabbit as if it's out of one of Tezuka manga's, uh, Tezuka Osamu's manga. And they bought this new piece of equipment and they're not sure why their specimen died and then one of the scientists mutters, oh, we bought it with American money, right? So this idea that American technology was a technology of war and death, because at the time, uh, you know, the Japanese base, American military bases in Japan were used heavily for the Vietnam War, and the Japanese government was also funding a lot of American, uh, Jap the American government was helping fund Japanese universities to um, study things like tropical diseases, uh, like things that would be useful for the American military as they fight communism in Southeast Asia and other tropical um, regions, right? And then you have Katsumata doing uh, a number of comics uh, about how the student movement was starting to question their professors, especially their science professors, to think about what their, what their research meant. Because a lot of professors are defending themselves saying, we're doing pure research. It is not up to us how it's applied industrially or militarily or by the government, but the uh, stu radical students thought that that was an irresponsible um, posture for university professors to take. So they questioned a lot of professors and asked them to think more about the grander uh, ramifications of their research. And one of the one of one area in which that was being questioned was uh, nuclear science. Right? Not only because it goes to weapons, but also because it goes to nuclear power plants. Um, and here is just the last two I want to show. Uh, you know, by the late 1960s, the radical student movement had been uh, wiped out or mar marginalized in Japan. And the kind of riot police had taken over a number of universities at examination period. And here you have one with a, uh, at a physics exam, right? Um, a student taking an entrance exam and the riot police kind of walks in and just scribbles on his book, just fucks with him and then leaves laughing. And then you have another one where uh, these students are given a tour of, of the university uh, uh, laboratories and they're basically walked around where the protests are happening out front. So the university was very much keen on hiding from prospective students that science and its application were, were being criticized on university campuses um, in Japan. Um, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there because there's a lot more that uh, Katsumata did. But as I said, uh, you know, in the 1970s, the anti-nuke movement really uh, started, kicked off in Japan. Here's a good photograph showing an early protest, mainly run by uh, women farmers uh, in Tohoku, right? And by the late 19. Um, and then also in the anti-nuclear bombs movement, uh, so-called housewives, the married women, um, were uh, main uh, organizers of signature campaigns against nuclear weapons in the States. And there was one main newspaper that was associated with the Japanese Communist Party called uh, uh, Women's Democratic Club Newspaper. Um, and Katsumata became hired, was hired by this um, magazine, this newspaper, uh, in the late 70s to start doing a weekly panel, uh, four panel series. And about one third of them, oh, that's not too much, maybe about one fifth of them had to deal with nuclear power in different ways, uh, beginning with um, Three Mile Island accident going through Chernobyl and he stopped in the early 1990s. Um, so the projects that I've been working on over the past year or two, um, initially it was supposed to be one compound project with about 120 pages worth of anti-nuclear cartoons by Katsumata, combined with maybe a 200-page text outlining Katsumata's career, anti-nuclear power comics in Japan, and then uh, set against the backdrop of the development of the anti-nuclear movement in Japan. Um, that book has had to be, for various reasons, split. So what's happening now is that 
um, from Breakdown Press, probably early 2018, will be a book called Fukushima Devilfish, which is a mix of uh, works about the Japanese countryside from Garo, and then a couple of those two nuclear power gypsy works um, from later magazines. There'll be one book, and then eventually there'll be a second book, uh, more academic and technical in nature, which will include the history I was talking about and more of the political strips, about 120 of them total. So that's my talk. So thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I think you're supposed to go to the mic. Uh, hello? Okay. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for the really informative talk. Um, my question is, do you know of any current uh, mangaka or any current series that are in either influenced by Katsumato's work or um, by these movements in general? Uh, who are active now? That are active now, yes. So to answer the question about Katsumata, um, not that I know of, and it's really unfortunate, it's really interesting and important body of work, um, but you know he was mainly publishing in very minor manga magazines and you know, left-wing newspapers, which had a limited circulation, especially by the 70s and 80s in Japan. So it's an interesting body of work, but it probably his main audience was uh, kind of an in-crowd. Um, so I don't know, you know, and none of it was republished until recently, right? 2011 had one collection, and then some of these four panel strips have also come out, but he did more than that. So I don't know, if there was any influence, it probably would have to be more recently, right? But I don't know of any. Um, now, in terms of a, a longer trajectory of the anti-nuclear movement in Japan influencing current cartoonists, after Chernobyl happened in 1986, it was a big deal everywhere, but it was also big in Japan. And one of the reasons it was big in Japan is at that point, Japan was importing a lot of exotic foodstuffs from around the world. So like, you know, like a lot of spices for Italian food were coming from Turkey and other countries that had fallout for Chernobyl. And it was kind of a delayed reaction. It was like 1987, 88. And at that point, like a lot of middle class Japanese who were eating these like pasta and Western foods, they were saying, oh shit, that this actually impacts us through spices, you know? So it like became kind of an urban movement at, at that point, right? And you have a number of artists who were active. There's a lot of protest movements at the time that incorporated culture and manga and anime culture in different ways which is kind of a forgotten history. I mean, if, you're, if you guys are familiar with Japanese contemporary art like Takashi Murakami, he was involved to some degree in the anti-nuke uh, protests in the late 1980s. And so there's potential that his work with Little Boy and the Bomb might have come out of that subsequently. Another artist named Shiriagari Kotobuki, who did some, most, probably the most interesting post-Fukushima manga. I seem to recall that he was also interested in nuclear power around the time of Chernobyl. Right? So I think it's probably less this early phase and more about the era of Chernobyl, because it, it kind of like turned the anti-nuke movement, which was largely a rural issue, and not about nuclear power, but about you know, basically Tokyo and the government stealing its farmland and fishing rights. And by the, especially after Chernobyl, it became kind of more of an urban issue. So I think at that point, there was some impact on cartoonists to the present. So even like, I think like even artists like uh, Moto Hagio, who did something post Fukushima, you know, a lot of them will talk about Chernobyl as the first time that they re remember, they realize that it was an issue. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for that really interesting talk. Can you hear me okay? okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really appreciate how you unpacked the anti-nuclear movement as, you know, there is the weapons, anti-nuclear weapons, and also anti-nuclear energy. And I was wondering from your research, if you at all um, encountered any um, art or manga, um, cartoons, what have you, about the nuclear umbrella specifically. Oh. Um, and I, I'm just curious because I haven't really seen that as part of the discussion. Right. Um, and a lot of the art pieces that you uh, presented, it's about uh, presumably Japan actually 
um, trying to pursue a nuclear weapons program or just nuclear right. anti-nuclear weapons in sure. general. But I was wondering if there is anything that you've seen that's about the United States trying to protect maybe right. South Korea or, or, or Japan right. and that, you know, I guess public perception of the umbrella yeah. in general. I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question. It's like, you know, obviously the, the foundation, legal foundation of the umbrella would be AMPO, right? The U.S.-Japan Mutual Security Treaty. And AMPO brought other things like these kind of uh, research, co-research endeavors that I talked about. Those are kind of founded on the security treaty in different ways. Um, I mean, this one, I'm not really sure what it's about, but even this first one that he did is like, why are Japanese children making missiles and bombs with English on them, right? It's like potentially this is some kind of comment. You know, and at the time, only recently, I think, after American archives become public, that people, Japanese researchers even realized that the government, and the Japanese government, the US government had an agreement to allow American nuclear weapons to be stationed in uh, ports, not just in Okinawa, but also in around the Tokyo region. Like Yokosuka had nuclear, Jap American nuclear weapons go in and out of it quite often. And the Japanese government always denied this, saying it would never allow nuclear weapons anywhere near its territory. But in fact, the prime minister, the LDP, the ruling party, and the American government had a secret agreement that it was basically don't ask, don't tell. So there's, I think, dozens of times that American nuclear weapons pass through uh, the states. But so that, that, in that sense, in the way like nuclear weapons are physically at the American military bases, and the, nuclear, the nuclear umbrella being that specific, people might have suspected it back then, um, but you know, there wasn't really common knowledge. So I guess my long answer, the short answer to that long answer is, uh, I don't know of any that, any that are specifically commenting on that. Garo did, Shirato Sampe, who was the founding editor and artist of Garo, he did some political cartoons in which he's equating, uh, you know, basically that if you have the American nuclear umbrella protecting it, it also means that American mil military facilities in Japan will probably be the first target in the Pacific of any kind of Cold War nuclear, uh, uh, Cold War nuclear war, right? So there are some political cartoons. Probably if I, if you dug a little bit in, in left-wing publications, they would come out. And I'm sure if you looked in Google 13, Saito Takao's thing, I mean, he, he basically picked up on every political topic there is and did some kind of James Bond thing with it. So I mean, you can find it, find it there, but no, I don't know of anything in a major way. Hi, I have a question about. Um, Oishimbo a couple years ago had an yeah. arc where the protagonist went up to Fukushima yeah. and after radiation exposure started to have bloody yeah. noses, right? And then nuclear industry basically forced them to stop publishing it. And I know that they got letters in the next issue where they were able to say, oh, you know, this is misleading yeah. and this sort of stuff. And I was wondering what the repercussions of that has been. Has it sort of chilled people's ability to use that format to kind of take this on? Um. I don't, I mean, I've, I've, I, know, I know what you're talking about. I've read some of it. I haven't kept up to date recently what's happened. I know he's, I mean, subsequently he did more things about Fukushima and he's, he was already kind of semi-retired, just right. kind of doing stories once in a while. But yeah, the, there was a lot of pressure for them to stop. I mean, the story I heard was basically, it was what you would think it was. It was basically one person like, plan, it was like one reader letter that got like exploded uh -huh. and then was taken up by the press so that ref, it forced you know, the publisher to kind of stop the series and issue apologies for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, a, it's also kind of an interesting issue. It's like, how do you visualize low level exposure? And there's, there are misleading ways to do it. Mm -hmm. right? And I guess that's like, for me, it's like, that is like kind of like a lazy way to show it. It's like, you're, no one's probably gonna get a nosebleed from right. going to Fukushima, right? So I think probably even if you were like a responsible anti-nuke activist, you would see that kind of probably these exaggerated symbols and metaphors probably aren't really helpful for what you want to do because they obscure the issues by blowing up the stereotypes in different ways. So, but I, I don't know exactly what's happened. But I think we're out of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, you have one more? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sure. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you for this really wonderful presentation. I especially enjoyed how you linked uh, suspicions of nuclear power with other leftist issues in Japan, uh, military bases, so on and so forth. Uh, 
Uh, it seems like a lot of the suspicions of the anti-nuclear uh, energy movement have been sort of vindicated by recent events. Mm -hmm. uh, however, with the threat of nu uh, nuclear North Korea, mm -hmm. missile tests, um, has, the, has the nuclear energy party in Japan sort of put a lid on everything? where people aren't really talking about it anymore, or is it a, the, a the general disaster, issue? The 2011 disaster. Yes, yeah. the Fukushima disaster. No, the government did the exact opposite. I mean, because the, you know, so much money is invested in nuclear power in Japan, and so many big companies, Toshiba, Hitachi, and all the big construction companies are invested in it. So they needed to kind of move forward immediately. And Abe, the prime minister, said something infamous afterwards, which is basically like, now that we've had an accident, we know how to avoid ones in the future, so Japanese technology and reactor building is perfect. But they knew that in the, develop, the de developed worlds, they would no longer have a market, and in Japan, the market was probably dead. So they started uh, really pushing uh, ex nuclear exports into developing Asia, right? And that's kind of also falling apart, and also because a uh, big deal is actually happening in the, in the United States which is there's two plants in South Carolina being built by Duke Energy that were recently canceled. Um, and Toshiba, I think, is part of the, the main company building them. So basically, the nuclear industry in Japan is just flailing at this point, right? Um, but in Japan, you know, it's, they're not linked. It's not like in the United States where you can call a nuclear power plant a bomb fa factory in a way because... Um, <clears throat> You know, the, Japan has the, the capacity to pull plutonium out of spent fuel from nuclear power plants, but it has no bombs program, right? So there's, there's not, they're not linked like they are in countries that have an overt or covert bombs program, right? So I don't think, I don't, I don't know, I'm not, I, haven't been in, I haven't been reading the news recently, but I can't imagine there'd be any way for them to like link, let's beef up our military, the nuclear umbrella, U.S. nuclear umbrella, because North Korea is going berserk. Right, so I don't know if they're linked or not. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time.